And we're on. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Most likely, they're at the abandoned asylum worshipping Satan. Greetings, metalheads. And welcome to another episode of Here Lies Metal, the podcast that brings you the origins, history, and culture of everything metal. Once again, I am your host, Maledictus, and I will be your overlord for today and all of eternity. Welcome. Satan is everywhere. He's in our homes and schools and our bedrooms. He's tempting our children with games of decadent escapism from their authority-controlled lives. For you're, you're only trying to help them, of course. He's cleverly hidden in the words and music recited from the wicked mouths of their long-haired rock heroes. But rejoice! Our children are not lost. As authority figures, you and me, we shall set out to combat Satan with the Bible, with the American court system, and best of all, with total bullshit lies. Satan is coming for your children, for our children. So the time is nigh for satanic panic. Now, if you remember the 1980s, I don't know how old you are, but I was there. I was a child in Catholic school. They were a time of many clashing cultures. We had the new Reaganites, this new type of Republican, you had an uncovering and a public, the first public knowledge of the Church of Satan. Those were the guys we all feared back then. They were real. You had the evangelicals, the TV evangelicals. You know, ones that used to steal your money. They used to, you used to send them money and then uh, they would say, God will strike them down if you didn't send them money. Remember that guy? Was he Jiggy, Jimmy Swaggart? I think it was. There was a number of them. And they obviously all turned out to be corrupt and people would still send them money. And of course... There was a new war on drugs. All these things together created the satanic panic. The media was in full scare mode. Full scare mode. Causing your baby boomer parents to go into full scale panic thinking Satan was going to take babies out of their crib and eat them. It seems laughable these days, but this was a der- an error before we had the internet. So you couldn't go and look something up on uh, YouTube and watch InfoWars and find out the truth, right? You had to take their word for it. Unless, where would you do research though? The information in the library wasn't current. So you, you this, would, this was gospel. You believed it, I believed it. I was a child and I was scared of Satan. I was scared I would listen to something and I would turn satanic and kill myself. This was true. We lived in an era, <clears throat> you and me, of, we were unsupervised kids. This, this was the last era of unsupervised kids, the Gen Xers. And this, of course, is another ingredient that led to the satanic panic. What were your children doing while you were at work? What were they listening to? Who were they hanging out with? You also had um, a culture of, a, a new culture of sex and violence in TV and in music. And this, you had it more than ever. You had an increase in this more than ever because of a response to this morning in America, this new cultural uh, regression. So, the artists responded by doubling down, and the war started. So this, of course, led to a new witch hunt, a witch hunt in your suburbs. This was perpetrated. This was uh, this was hyped up by a few certain people, which we're going to go over. They, they, it was their business to scare parents, and that got them ratings, got them fame, and it ultimately led to their downfall. Now, there's always an internal need for a boogeyman, as you know. We always... Need someone to be scared of. Someone's going to get your kids. And this leads to a new era of McCarthyism, a new witch hunt. We need a new enemy. We have communists, but they're a little far. They're on the other side of the world. What's There's got to be a boogeyman in your nice, safe suburban neighborhood. So what do we do? Well, parents felt like they were losing control of their children. Uh, like I said before, unsupervised children, uh, a whole new culture that their children were being exposed to. This is before the internet, of course. I wonder 
you know, what we'll be writing about 10 years from now. I remember these times, uh, doing the research for this particular podcast. I seem to remember a lot of the starting in the 80s, but most of it actually took place. The brunt of the satanic panic took place in the early 90s. So my personal experience in this, what I remember, being a brainwashed Catholic school student, uh, I was exposed to, obviously, these brutal Catholic images that really uh, helped my interest in metal happen. I mean, when you go to church, when you see religious books or or hear stories about it, of the Bible for the you know for your if you're a Catholic, um, the, the Catholic religion is particularly brutal. There's a lot of torture. There's a lot of pain. You, you get redemption through pain. So this sticks to the mind of, of an eight-year-old and makes metal happen. It makes metal a little uh, more attractive as, as opposed to getting into some sort of normal music. I remember one particular story. And I'm ranting here, but hey, we've got plenty of time, right? Uh, there used to be this little sticker machine in my school. And I would put, you'd put like a quarter in it and out would come a sticker. Just It, it was an oval sticker. It had glitter on it. And it had a band's name, a contemporary band of the time. Uh, Prince or Duran Duran. It was in a, it was in a sans serif font. It wasn't in the band's logo. It simply came out, and it would say, "You get a sticker that said Duran Duran." And I was one of the Duran Duran sticker. I, I, Duran Duran was my favorite band at the time, and I kept putting quarters in the machine every day. And I would get like Cindy Lauper or something, or or Prince or something like that, or, or someone that you know. And it was like, ah, I, I could throw away this sticker. I don't want this sticker, but I put a quarter in the machine, and out came to my fear and my my horror. A Judas Priest sticker. And I had heard, even back then, you had heard bad things about Judas Priest. This was well into the 80s. And Judas Priest was one of those, and just with a name like Judas Priest, that just sounded just the most anti, that sounded like the most anti-religious thing you could possibly name a band. Judas, that's that's the guy that killed Jesus. And he's a priest? I, I think that's an expression, right? Am I right? But to me, that just like, we're going to call our band Judas Priest because I remember my mother talking about that. Wow, they called their band Judas Priest. Ju Judas, he betrayed Jesus. So that sounded bad to me. And I, and I have the sticker now. And I didn't want to show anyone that I got the sticker because they might think it was my fault for getting the sticker. So I just would sort of hide the sticker. And I would keep it because I paid 25 cents for it. I didn't want to just throw it out. It was a cool sticker, but I didn't stick it on anything. And uh, eventually I got that Duran Duran sticker, though. And I was very happy. I was like, oh, my God, I finally got the Duran Duran sticker. It took a while. It took a lot of quarters. In New Jersey, where I grew up, you would hear about the teenagers, the drunk teenagers that you weren't supposed to go near because they might give you acid or alcohol or something. But you'd see them, you know, in the distance at the park uh, committing, you know, debaucherous acts. And you would just, you know, your parents would be like, don't go near them. You know, tell your children not to walk their way. Tell your children not to hear their words, what they mean, what they say. Yeah, you weren't supposed to go near those guys. They were Glenn Danzig. You don't want to go near Glenn Danzig today. No one wants to go near Glenn Danzig. And um, these kids would hang out. It, back in, the, in New Jersey at the time, there were a lot of abandoned mental asylums due to the budget cuts. I believe these were formerly government mental asylums, and they would simply shut them down and just left them there before the condo developers came. You would have a large swaths of land that contained, um, that were the properties of former mental institutions, and these were just... You know, you had your own hangout. You you could drink beer and worship Satan. So you would find a lot of, if you see pictures from these things in the news and it'd be pentagrams and sacrifice animals because kids are bored. They may have their little coven. They drink some beer and uh, you stayed clear of these kids. So that's what I remember. And of course, finally, Dungeons and Dragons. I remember playing Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. I was in day camp, in summer camp, and I was one of the younger kids and my brother was there too and he would hang out with the older kids and they would have sessions of D&D &D every day. So I, w I wanted to do that. I didn't want to, you know, play with the kids my age. I didn't like any of them, and I don't feel like they liked me. So I was like, hey, I want to do that. That's I know th I knew that was going to be my future. You know, I was heading for uh, a life of nerddom, unfortunately. You know, that, that wasn't a cool thing back then. I, I guess today it'd be like, oh, wow, you're into D&D. &D. But back then it was like, oh, you're into D&D. &D. I'm sorry to hear that. So I was immediately attracted to that. So I never felt D and D was threatening in any way, you know. And I, this was a guy that went to Catholic school was afraid of Judas Priest sticker. I never ever felt that D and D was um, was enticing me to get into the occult or anything like that. So that's my opinion. And of course, people had different experiences with it. 
I also wasn't taking it that seriously. But obviously this was something that would come up in the media multiple times. Even spawning a bad Tom Hanks movie, which we'll get into. Now, we have this new witch hunt. And we had a few instigators, as we mentioned. Satan was in suburbia, and you had to know about it, and you had to fear it. And our friend, Geraldo Rivera, uh, was going to expose this in, um, I believe it was a miniseries or a series he had on one of the channels. I think maybe it was NBC at the time. And uh, you all know Geraldo Rivera. You know, he's that sleazy reporter that, like, he's like the guy from Die Hard, that, that guy who uh, gets punched out by... Bruce Willis by by John McClane's wife at the end. That's basically Geraldo, that guy right there. That's Geraldo in a nutshell. Uh, Geraldo Rivera made a show called Exposing Satan's Underground. And it's... I, I provided the link to this on our... on our Twitter and our Facebook. So you can see. I'm going to provide all the links that I use to, for reference for this particular podcast. They're all hilarious uh, clips retro 1980s, 1990s clips of people uh, under people under the influence of satanic panic. It's it's quite hilarious. But Geraldo made a show called Exposing Satan's Underground. And it it's pretty funny. You should watch it. Um, what can we expect from a guy who gave us the mystery of Al Capone? The mystery of Al Capone's vaults. I remember staying up late hoping they would find skeletons in the vault and they found nothing. And I was very disappointed and I haven't forgiven Geraldo yet. Uh, we had other instigators as well. We had other uh, talk show hosts, people that your parents would watch. We had Morton Downey Jr. Uh, I particularly remember an episode with him featuring Ace Freely, but he trusted Ace Freely. Ace Freely was on his side, though. They were attacking other louder and more ridiculous acts. I think Morton Downey Jr. could probably relate to Ace Freely. They have similar drinking habits. So he was like, hey, this guy's all right. You know, he's a racist like me, too. Another instigator was, of course, the wife of Al Gore by the name of Tipper Gore. You all remember her, maybe. Wife of Senator Al Gore at the time. You remember Al Gore, the guy that mysteriously lost the 2000 election to George W. Bush. And he made the inconvenient truth and grew a beard. And he was hunting man, bear, pig. Well, his wife at the time seemed to have some sort of problem with uh, music and Basically, she wanted music labeled, but she came up with all sorts of levels of propaganda for your parents to fear and to perhaps scrutinize the music their kids are listening to. But it seemed it seemed very uh, it didn't seem helpful. Some might look back and say, "Well, she was just trying to label music," but it it it, it seemed like we were headed towards censorship back then. And I'm glad it wasn't a trend in music because I don't I think it's quite the opposite. I don't think we're being uh, our music, I mean, our music is being controlled by people that make very lousy music, but I think edginess is sort of what we sell today. So these tactics didn't make things any better for their side. And um, the, fifth, the Filthy 15 was was uh, kind of laughable. Um, now, I, I had always thought that uh, bands like Merciful Fate and Venom were not on the Filthy 15, but however they were, it simply had zero effect on them. In fact, these bands were probably not even aware they were on it, did not affect their careers. No one paid attention to them. Um, Merciful Fate and Venom were on the list for occult themes, obviously, and I don't seem to remember it affecting them in any way, being that they were from Europe. Um, I think they were, also they were underground bands, so I think they were kind of removed from this and were not aware of it. However, other bands that you did hear of that were on MTV, on a regular basis, this is what concerned parents because they were seeing these videos. They were seeing their kids watch these videos. And uh, some spots include, <laughs> these are laughable, uh, Judas Priest, Motley Crue, ACDC, Twisted Sinister, Wasp, obviously, uh, Def Leppard, Black Sabbath. And of course, they shared this list with a few uh, spots of contemporary pop stars like Cyndi Lauper and Prince. They, of course, were on it for obscenity, for sexual themes. Bands like Judas Priest were on there for, I think it was a violent theme. And Twisted Sister, Wasp, it was obviously sexual. Def Leppard, I believe, was on there for an alcohol reference. Basically, you got different categories of why you were on there. And all of the reasons, all of the offenses seem pretty uh, tame for today. I imagine if they made a Filthy 15 today, what they could possibly uh, put on this list. It, it would be laughable and it would be kind of funny. It's like how they didn't like Elvis, how, how they 
had caught a fit over Elvis's gyrations. And in the 90s, they so didn't like someone singing about drinking a beer. One more uh, and the most comical example of instigators of the Satanic Panic was the Law Enforcement's Guide to Satanic Cults. This was a video. It was a very 90s video done in video, like videotape. Uh, this link, of course, is included in Facebook the, pertaining to this episode and Twitter. Uh, this is the one you have to watch. This is a comical video. Uh, it's a social fear-mongering campaign to the level of... It's today's reefer, or not today, but the reefer madness of the early 90s. It's replacing weed with Satan. And this was actually made by a police force, I believe, by some sort of uh, law enforcement body. And this beautifully taped video in the early 90s uh, had that... It, it reminded me of a, of a classic Oldsmobile silhouette. You remember that minivan? It was really streamlined, and sometimes it had wood paneling. That's what the video reminded me of. That's the feel it gave me, that early 90s, just stylist time. You remember it. That's how the video felt to me. And uh, one of the things he said was, that which is good is bad, and that which is bad is good. That was one of the lines he used just when he says it. It's, just watch it. You will laugh. Now, the, the Satanic Panic, of course, wasn't just a Satanic Panic. It had targets it had victims they were they were they were some people that were going to be on the receiving end of the satanic panic that's what we're going to get on to next we're going to get into the trials um these are actually real court cases of crimes committed by certain people that the media construed as being driven by satan um none of of course which were true uh, some of these were drug deals gone bad others were wrongly accused people uh, most of them were wrongly accused people actually. However, the result and the victims were uh, considered being victims of satanic ritual abuse. We're going to actually uh, revisit this topic because it's a very interesting one to me. And it's almost comical, even though it's kind of sad and tragic. It's it, 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 just this type of kid was that guy you avoided. He, he was the guy I, that would hang out at the mental asylums and worship Satan, but he was ridiculous and he's kind of laughable even though he was a murderer and he was a psychotic guy. But this is the case of the Acid King murder. Now, this was the first case of Satan in the suburbs. Uh, this is the story of Ricky Casso. Uh, he, Ricky Casso was no stranger to trouble. In fact, he was called the Acid King. I guess that's where that band got the name from. That's a pretty cool thing to call your band. I like that. If that's where who the Asic thing you're referring to is, uh, briefly, um, and we're going to do this briefly because we're going to revisit this story. In June of 1984, in a pleasant suburb in Long Island called Northport, there was a guy named Ricky Casso. Ricky Casso liked to do a lot of acid. One day, him and his four buddies went out to the woods to worship Satan and do acid and drink and cause a ruckus like teenagers do. I guess they didn't have a mental asylum to do this in, so they just went out to a bonfire. A guy named uh, Gary Lawyers, uh, him and Ricky were having a rivalry over a case of stolen angel dust. Basically, um, Ricky Casso claimed that Gary stole his angel dust, $50 worth, without paying him. So in a fit of rage during their night of partying, and Ricky Casso decided to steal to stab Gary Lowers to death. And as he killed him, he said, say you love Satan. Say you love Satan. This, of course, uh, in obviously when the court case happened and witnesses te the testimony of the witnesses, this, of course, came up and the media had a field day with it. Uh, the other kids involved in this murder, his accomplices, who, of course, were accomplices because they tried to hide this, even though they were not involved in the murder. Um, he was with a guy named Albert Quinones and Vinnie Toretto. And one of them, of course, would go to jail. And one of them would, uh, would, would rat on them to get himself out of prison. Uh, when Gary turned up missing the next day, uh, no one cared. No one went looking for him. He was a frequent runaway. I believe his parents were not in the picture. Uh, he was a delinquent and... He was a target for the cops. The cops basically said if it wasn't uh, Ricky that did the killing, it would have been Gary. 
being that no one went looking for Gary lawyers, uh, Ricky Casso would take other friends from the high school that he attended to the site of the murder to uh, show them Gary Lawyer's decomposing body. So he was like, hey, check out, check out what I did. And he was proud of it. And not one of these kids told the cops. So this, these kids were very bored, you can imagine. Finally, after, I think, a few weeks of this, uh, someone finally ratted anonymously. They arrested Ricky. I'm sorry, they made Ricky Casso show them the site of the murder where uh, he proudly showed them his work. Story of Ricky Casso. We're going to revisit this. We're going to get into the full detail of this. But basically, the media got a hold of this. This was a satanic killing. He killed poor Gary Lawlers because Gary Lawlers would not say he loved Satan. And there's this picture of him when he was arrested and he's looking at the camera and, he, and he's that guy. And he's got this face and you just know he's that guy. You know, he has no regret on his face. This guy was a twisted individual. This is the story of Ricky Casso, the Acid King. We will get into that again, though, because we can go on forever about him. That's a metal story. The metal story of Ricky Casso, the Acid King. Uh, next and very high profile uh, trial was the McMartin Preschool trial. Now, this was based on the McMartin family. They were owners of a local preschool in uh, Manhattan Beach, California, I believe it was. And um, they were accused of ritual abuse. Now, ritual abuse meant, kids, you were being abused through the rites of Satan. You were being pissed on or shit on or defecated on or jizzed on something. They, you, in, all in the name of Satan, you were being victimized. And these, this family, the Martin family, they were accused. And of course, this is, these are career-destroying accusations. Now, they destroyed you in the eyes of society. I think about this was a tar this was uh, this dark cloud over your head and everyone knew everyone thought in town thought this is what you were you were a satanic child molester imagine trying to go through life like that now this is where the story gets more ridiculous and this was just um a fa a, a tremendous experiment in psychology and how things could go particularly insane 1200 kids made allegations against the big martins 1200 kids 300 counts of molestation were filed. Now, th this is just, uh, it's not even, it doesn't seem even possible by the amount of how many people they were working there. What happened here was the kids that made accusations or were coerced by the, uh, there was a company hired to, to do the testing of the kids, psychological evaluation, to the point where it got completely ridiculous. And one topic that kept coming up was, child defecation. They were defecated upon by the McMartins in light of their satanic ritual abuse. There's the rituals of defecation on the children. That's what happened. Uh, the claims were so outrageous that even Chuck Norris was accused. Now, I'm not kidding. I'm, I didn't just make that up. Chuck Norris's name came up. Chuck Norris satanically defecated upon me for Satan. Chuck, this is Chuck Norris. Mr. Uh, Christian karate fighter defecated upon me. You know, in hell where Satan lives, there was mass hysteria over fears of Chuck Norris worshippers. Uh, Do you know that subliminal messages by Chuck Norris caused Satan to kill himself? Okay, I'll stop. Sorry. Maybe we'll go more into the McMartin trial. It wasn't as interesting to me. However, it was a major factor in the satanic panic. Finally, you heard of this one, the West Memphis Three. On May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-olds were brutally murdered in the town of West Memphis, Arkansas. In the town, there was a demand for revenge. They wanted to know who killed God's children. Three boys, these were like white trash kids, kids that had long hair, kids that listened to metal, goths they came up they were the targets they were the obvious it was obviously them three boys jason baldwin jesse miss kelly and of course damian eccles these kids all had records in juvenile delinquency they weren't good kids however they weren't killers they were apprehended within a month and charged with capital murder these were kids that were underage after a very brief trial Two received life, and the other, Damien Eccles, who was really the face of the West Memphis Three, was sentenced to death. Um, 
these kids looked the part. They wore metal shirts, like I said. They listened to Slayer. Damien Echols was a goth. I mean, I'll be, you know, I would probably targeted him too. This is a big mistake in West Memphis. Imagine life there, and you're gonna go around like a goth. I mean, it's seems likely. It seems like what you should do. Like, what else can you do? Once again, uh, the news media began to fan the flames of this ongoing satanic panic. This was a perfect storm. In the Bible Belt, the satanic panic results in bloodthirsty witch hunts, of course. That's what you can expect there. I mean, they're going to come after you with guns. They are they want their witches, and they're going to get them. And those goths, that must be him. That's the guy that killed those, those boys. Uh, basically, in an abbreviated version, this story goes on for a long time. A lot of rock stars got involved. The three boys were eventually released, and they were given time served after serving 18 years for murders they most likely did not commit. This was the result of a lot of fundraisers by guys like Henry Rollins and Slayer, and a lot of they made a whole album for these kids. It was basically the the new Reuben Carter case of, of modern rock stars at the time. Now we're going to get into the defendants. These were civil cases against rock stars for suicides. My child or children killed themselves because of your song. I have proof. We're going to play it backwards. You remember these. This is what made metal. It's laughable today, but this was a thing in the early 90s and late 80s. We'll start with old King Ozzy Osbourne. Yep, we know Ozzy. The guy can hardly form a sentence. Thank God for Sharon Osbourne for saving him. Yes, I said that. It's because of Sharon. You can hate Sharon all you want, but Ozzy, we wouldn't have Ozzy Osbourne if it wasn't for Sharon. He would be dead somewhere and forgotten. That's the truth, people. In January 1986, a civil lawsuit was filed against Ozzy Osbourne by the parents of the late John McCollum. John was obviously a depressed high school dropout with a lot of issues that his parents were in obviously obvious denial of. I mean, the kid was, his life was not good. He, he was a kid with mental problems. He was a depressed kid. He, he was a high school dropout. The shit was not going good for John McCollum. Naturally, with the help and aid of the bloodthirsty media, they had someone to blame. Oh, that Ozzy guy, that bat-eating guy, that evil guy. And uh, he had a song called Suicide Solution. That must have been the reason. Let's find it. Let's play it backwards. There's got to be, they told this kid to kill himself. I mean, it's called Suicide Solution. That's the solution. It's suicide when your life sucks. Uh, this, of course, to the media was a pro-suicide message in this song. Suicide Solution. Um, and of course, they were looking for subliminal messages. That was popular at the time. I'm so glad we let that go. Subliminal messages. Can you... Who thought this... Who believed this shit? We did. We didn't have any... We didn't know any better. I thought subliminal messages were coming to get me. They were going to cause me to jump out a window or something. We were scared of them. Uh, we all know, of course, now that the song Suicide Illusion is about alcohol abuse. And it was specifically written for Ozzy's late friend and ACDC vocalist Bon Scott, who uh, didn't, didn't, didn't necessarily drink himself to death, but he froze to death as the result of alcohol, and he, he liked the alcohol. Let's face it, he was Scottish. He liked alcohol. Just some, most Scots are strong enough to survive that problem, but not all of them do. Some of them fall, and poor Bon Scott was one of them. Finally, we all remember Judas Priest. Now, 1985, 20-year-old James Vance and Raymond Belknap, uh, 18, listened, uh, they basically spent a night of, uh, hours of smoking weed and drinking and listening to the Staying Class record over and over again. This, uh, actually sounds very similar to an average day of mine in my 20s. That's what we used to do. We'd listen to Staying Class over and over, backwards, forwards, and smoke weed. I'm still alive, people. We, it was just one of our pastime activities. We weren't looking for anything, uh, they decided to suddenly, these two boys, decided to suddenly end their lives with a shotgun at a, at a local playground. Uh, I think these kids had much bigger problems than the staying class record, which is a good record, by the way. I mean, if they commit suicide to the turbo record, uh, that might have been a little more controversial, maybe. I was listening to turbo today. It's not terrible, people. 
I certainly wouldn't commit suicide over this record. Both kids in this playground took turns and shot their shot themselves in the fucking head with shotguns. Uh, Belknap was killed instantly by shooting himself with a shotgun. However, um, James Vance survived the shotgun blast with face, but succumbed to the injuries a few years later. He was basically incapacitated and eventually died. Eventually, a legal team hired by the parents years later uh, alleged that subliminal messages um, in the form of do it uh, were included in the song Better By You, which, like I said before, interesting enough, is a cover by um, an English blues band called Spooky Tooth. Pretty good version, but I like the Judas Priest version better. Is the subliminal message in the Spooky Tooth song, too? I always wondered that. Like, well, did that song ever make anyone kill themselves? I wonder. Now, when they got to the trial, which began, I remember this trial, of course, uh, began in July of 1990 and pretty much was wrapped up in a month and, of course, was reasonably and rationally dismissed by the judge uh, who ruled once again that uh, claims of subliminal messages are total bullshit. And I think that was the last time that happened, subliminal messages. They were like, okay, this is bullshit. And Judas Priest saved us. I seem to recall clearly uh, Rob Halford actually singing under oath, not, not testifying, but actually singing the chorus to Better By You, Better Than Me in the courtroom as the judge looked on awkwardly, I would say. It was ridiculous. And it was that point the jury realized and the judge realized that these, these accusations were completely ridiculous and they were thrown out, obviously. Uh, and from this point on, I don't think ba a band ever came under such an attack. I mean, there would be other things in the future that we may or may not talk about that other bands had gone through in a court of law or in public, in the public eye. But however, Judas Priest would would never be uh, taken to that level again, and subliminal messages would never, ever be taken seriously again from that point on. We've moved past that, finally. Next, we go to uh, probably the most important subject in the satanic panic and that was not music but it was a game called dungeons and dragons and maybe you've played it and this was a reoccurring theme of the whole satanic panic movement that even though it has nothing to do with music it's undeniably metal uh, it was the metal guys and the nerds together that were playing DD in those days in the 1980s I myself, as maybe an eight-year-old or nine-year-old, uh, tried to get into D&D &D when I was in summer camp. And my older brother had been playing with these other boys. They had a D&D &D session every afternoon, and I wanted to be on it. I wanted to do that. I was like, hey, that's me. I'm, I'm into that stuff. And it was catered towards the older kids in the camp, but I wanted to be part of it. So somehow, you know, they let me. I'm going I'm to, like, wind or whatever, and they had let me into the room. And this is where the big boys hung out. So, you know, there were no other interested parties of the kids my age. It was only me who wanted to degrade himself into being a nerd. Because, like I said, this was not a cool thing back then. It was not cool to be a nerd back then. You were, you know, you were setting yourself up to have a bad time in the immediate future, socially. And if you wanted to meet girls, if you wanted to hang out with people, you know, you were, you were not aiming for that life. And I was fine with that. I was like, well, this is, I'd rather you know, hang out with my friends and have fun. I, I don't want to be uh, the popular guy. And, you know, that paid off because I wasn't, and uh, I was fine with that. This was a time when kids did not have video games. I mean, we had video games, but they were very rudimentary. There, there was nothing like today, which with the online play and online universes, they, they have ultimately replaced playing games on paper. I'd say you get a few retro hipsters these days who insist on playing board games, but I don't just don't see a need for it. I've, technology has uh, driven me away from even trying to do that. It's, it's so complicated today to try to do that. We are much more resourceful back then. But hey, whoever's doing it, if they could handle it, and if they could finish a game these days, there's so many distractions today. We, just, we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have computers. We didn't have anything bothering us. We had eight hours to play this game. And even back then, we wouldn't finish games, right? We would, it would just fade into something else. We would all fall asleep or get drunk. D&D &D was a frequent target of negative publicity by the 
authorities, and they insisted and they accused D&D of promoting Satanism, witchcraft, suicide, pornography, and murder. I don't know, those things all sound like pretty cool things. People into metal enjoy. Not that anyone's going out and killing themselves or murdering people, but those are the things we seek, right? We, we seek the negative aspects, the underbellies of society, don't we? And those things are appealing to us in a tongue-in-cheek manner, not in a real manner, people. No one's going to kill anyone. And there are a number of cases involving murders and suicide that were blamed on this very game, this very imaginary role-playing game. And we're not going to cover all of them because there were many, many cases uh, that made the public eye and that the media construed as being related to the occult and D&D. But we'll cover very quickly the James Egbert III story. Now, this story made for a popular urban legend in the 80s. Maybe maybe you heard it. Now, it went something like this. Uh, a typical D&D playing nerd from Michigan State. He was a high-achieving student. Definitely a nerd back then. It, it, it wasn't cool back then to be smart. If you weren't a preppy or a jock back then, like you see in the movies, in the 80s movies, the nerds are always made fun of. In some movies, that's glorified. Other movies, such as Revenge of the Nerds, you cheered for the nerds. But either way, they were nerds. Nerds! Now, uh, this kid, who got pretty obsessed and brainwashed by playing D&D as a nerd, that's, uh, that's what you did. I mean, that was your life. That was your escape. And uh, basically, he descended one day into the steam tunnels beneath the campus, never to return. That was the legend. It's like he's still down there or his, his ghost is still down there. Some say he or his disembodied ownery spirit disembodied through suicide as a result of D&D playing and Satan worship, obviously, is cursed to haunt the tunnels for all of eternity. But however, that was not true. Now, this part of the legend is true. He did, James Egbert III, was a nerd. True. Um, he enjoyed D&D. This was also true. And as a troubled youth, like many nerds of college age at that time, um, in the days before it was cool to be a nerd, as you know, today, you know, he would be a hipster. In 1979, James Egbert did in fact descend into these tunnels beneath the campus, which was tragically an unsuccessful attempt at suicide. He basically wanted to disappear into these tunnels. Uh, he was unsuccessful at his goal, but unfortunately he eventually emerged from the tunnels, and sadly, after multiple attempts in suicide, he was successful. And that was his story. That's where the story of James Egbert III ended. Uh, as, of course, a result of this, concerned authorities of the school and parents, his parents, uh, hired investigators to find out what exactly happened, and the investigations were conducted, and as a result of the investigations, a, a tell-all book was written titled The Dungeon Master in 1984, which naturally attracted the fear-mongering, uh, satanic panic-promoting uh, press. And this, of course, spanned, spawned many urban legends that the ones you've probably heard about this. This is how that used to work back, and there was no internet for anything to go viral. This was simply how things happened. Word of mouth, word of mouth, until the story was completely twisted. That's how things used to work back then. Ultimately, as a result of these myths, fictional novels were spun up upon these many myths. They were based on these urban legends. Why not write a book about something you heard? Make it, you know, embellish it a little bit. And uh, one particular book titled Mazes and Monsters, which was obviously a parody on D&D, &D, D &D, Dungeons and Dragons, Mazes and Monsters, that works, was adopted into a rather low-budget film. Uh, you probably never heard of this film. It's called Mazes and Monsters, starring a little-known and Far removed from the Hollywood icon he is today, Tom Hanks. It, it is pretty bad. You should watch this movie. If you're looking for, if you're looking for a bad movie night, this is your Huckleberry. JJ, what am I now, doing? In here? reality, uh, being that you probably played D and D as I did back then, as as a child, uh, we know that nothing ever gets done in a D and D game. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's you get it portrayed in in retro shows today, like Stranger Things, with these kids playing D and D. We were similar to that, but 
they, they seem to focus and actually take these things seriously. We never had a game so successful. We would play in day camp, and it would eventually degrade into nothing. And, of course, in day camp, we were kids, and there was no alcohol or anything like that involved. We, we just sat there, and eventually the game would turn into chaos and just us hanging out in a room. I don't feel like any game was ever finished. We just couldn't focus, I suppose. And when we would play at home with friends or other role-playing games, there were many others. There were certain sci-fi role-playing games we enjoyed as well. I don't think uh, we ever... We would rarely get through a mission. It, it would degrade into just uh, ridiculous chaos. And I can imagine teenagers of the day smoking weed under the influence of weed and, and alcohol. I, I can only imagine where games went under there. I'm sure they were a lot of fun, though. Uh, that's why we played. It was really to hang out with each other and have some sort of dialogue with each other about uh, in under the guise of some sort of escapism you know uh, you know it's your weekend from from school school's over you know you you're getting all together and, and having a great time and and, and that's what D&D really helped so D, i think D&D ultimately only gave us positive things and camaraderie between friends right i think in most D&D games if you were lucky a pizza was eaten beer was drank weed was smoked so you guys were together and that was it that was that's how it was going to be that was your D&D experience and Naturally, something like D&D, I think any time the nerds or the headbangers or anything like that were having fun, uh, it must have been bad So because they weren't the normal kids. They didn't look normal, so we had to watch them. They might be up to something. They might be up to suicide or murder or something like that. So I think, you know, I think the, the, the nerdy people or the different people got a lot of shit from the adults at the time because they weren't normal. And, and not being normal back then was, was, was not good. That's why it wasn't normal. Today, you know, edgy, of course, works. Being odd today is, is the normal. But back then, as you know, it was not quite the same. If you were a goth or a headbanger back then, you know, you, you had more of an identity. You were noticed, and you were probably ridiculed as a result. Now, where, what did all this satanic panic result in? What, where are we today? Did it fix anything? Did it damage anything? And I'm going to say no. We had so many people being accused and ostracized, lots of reputations possibly, uh, potentially ruined, and this was all for nothing. It didn't change anything. We still have metal music today. It only increased in popularity overall. It's only increased in edginess as a result. Uh, things that are said in contemporary uh, mainstream metal today uh, would never fly back then. It, I think also today we have normalized actual satanic themes in music. You could give the band Ghost, for example. They're a very popular band. They have a very mainstream following. Some might disagree with that, but you could say, I've been to many Ghost shows. It's pretty. They opened for Iron Maiden last year. It's pretty mainstream. I'm sure they're doing very well financially. And this is a band that uh, their themes and their their whole entire culture and their song titles are based on this occult ideal and this uh, occult narrative, this sort of a fictional narrative that the, uh, the Papa Emeritus, uh, I, I believe he's the architect of the entire thing. And I've got to say he's quite a genius for being in control of this entire operation, hiring musicians and firing musicians at his own whim and keeping this, this idea going. I think that's, that's really impressive, whether you like the band or not. Their, their songs are catchy, being that they're Swedish. Their songs are very catchy. And they have uh, imagery and song titles and themes that have to do with the occult. Of course, it's tongue-in-cheek. If you can't see that, if you think they're for real, I think you're a pretty silly person. And I think the media isn't even bothering with something like that. Obviously very visible in the eyes of the media. The media has moved on. They have other things to worry about today. They have other things to scare you about today. Uh, you're going to get a disease or you're going to be blown up or the world's going to end tomorrow. That's really what they work on now. Music is just so uninteresting to them now that we, they've moved on. And I guess that's good that music is not being attacked anymore. Where, where is Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest today, the, the accused bands in civil lawsuits? They're doing fine. They're... Ozzy is looked upon as a as a musical icon today. Was he even knighted? Or I don't know if he was knighted, but he's definitely met the queen. I mean, Sharon has really propped him up and made him into this normalized icon. Uh, it's also a result of the Gen Xers, the people that were young back then in those days, the people that were targets, the people that were scrutinized, the kids, the kids that were 
said to be killing themselves and worshiping Satan and killing each other, they're grown up now. They have jobs and money and families and kids, and they, of course, many of them kept their idols. They continued to listen to Ozzy and Judas Priest. They didn't forget about it and start listening to Phil Collins or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with Phil Collins. The music that our parents listened to at the time, we thought it was so lame. Now, perhaps the kids today, our children today, listen, they hear Judas Priest and maybe they think it's lame. But for the most part, I don't think they do. I think I've, I've seen, I've met a lot of young kids that uh, embraced uh, bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and Ozzy. They think it's great. So this music can actually be passed down. It's, it's the cool grown-up music, just like how maybe your parents might have listened to Led Zeppelin or Jimi Hendrix and you liked it and you're still listening to it. Well, it's the same thing. And now we're the grown-ups and we have this music. And this music is normalized because we're normalized. We all have jobs and we're not Satan worshippers. We're not killing each other or killing ourselves. Uh, we also have an internet age of music. And you could get all the facts or close to it and uh, there's no questions anymore. That's how things have changed today. And that's why we're not having another satanic panic. We have other sort of panics, but none of it has to do with Satan anymore. So unless, of course, you watch Alex Jones and Satan is everywhere and Satan is molesting your children. Otherwise, we've come a long way since those dark days. It's the bar has increased in shock value. And that goes for pop music and rap music and even country music. That is our podcast regarding the satanic panic of yesteryear. We will revisit very specific details of this story. Uh, most particular, the Ask King murders and perhaps the Judas Priest trial. Those are very interesting to me. Maybe Ozzy Osbourne get into the really in, intricate details about these stories. And getting ready to wrap up this podcast, folks, I would like to uh, once again say that we'll be sharing the links uh, that I use for research to compile this particular podcast about the Great Satanic Panic. And uh, they'll be available on Twitter at Here Lies Metal and Facebook, Here Lies Metal at Facebook. And I want you to email me if you have any questions or comments about this particular podcast. Tell me about your experience with Satanic Panic. Maybe you were accused of being a Satan worshiper or a child defecator, let me know. Uh, let me know how you remember the Judas Priest child trial or the Ozzy Osbourne trial. Share it with us at Hero Lives Metal, because that's what we're about. We're about the history of metal, and these were metal events, and I want you to tell us here at Hero Lives Metal your experience during this era of metal. Anyway, let's end this particular podcast. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. If you have anything to say please contact me uh at twitter here lies metal uh facebook at here lies metal instagram metal lies here i just posted a video of me doing some of this podcast live you can check it out uh promote this podcast tell everyone here lies metal at gmail.com and it is again it is my passion to bring you the listener all this information all these tales of metal and if you'd like to support this podcast your donations are highly appreciated and you could do that at patreon.com Patreon forward slash here lies metal. Send us a quarter. If all of you send us a quarter, that would be a couple of quarters. We could do something with that. We could buy coffee for people and that would be great because we like coffee here. Uh, keep the word going. Here lies metal. We are going to do more podcasts. We're going to keep the metal going. Whether you like it or not, we're going to keep it alive. All right, people, uh, watch out for Satan. Watch out for Jesus. They're all out to get you. If you don't watch out, they can be harmful. They can be great. All right, people, thank you for listening. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Oh, and one more thing. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes where we're available. Goodbye. Thank you.